Good evening. Welcome to this evening's program of the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Gerald Harris. I am chair of the club's technology and uh, society member-led forum, also a member of its board of governors, and will be your host for this evening's program. The Commonwealth Club is America's longest standing public forum. We are proud to maintain our focus on informing the public and our members about key local, national, and world developments. This is the place to be in the know. The focus of the Technology and Science and Society member-led forum is to expose members and attendees to current and emerging developments in science and technology, and in the process, generate thinking and ideas about the use and commercialization of technology in creating a better world for all. We welcome and encourage your participation in all of our programs. More information can be found at our website, the W's Commonwealth club.org. We also want to extend a special thanks to the folks at Wonderfest for their support of this evening's program. We welcome all of you remotely viewing this program via our online channel or, or who may be listening via other media. As the, as the program is proceeding, please feel free to submit your questions in the chat feature this evening online. And now to today's speaker, and moderator. There are advantages to thinking like a scientist. Jim Al-Khalili will help us. In his book, The Joy of Science, Jim invites people to, do, to engage with the world as scientists have been trained to do. Jim is a distinguished professor in theoretical physics at the University of Surrey and one of Britain's best known science communicators. His other books include The World According to Physics, Quantum, A Guide for the Perplex, that would certainly include me, and Life on the Edge, The Coming Age of Quantum Biology. Our program this evening will be moderated by Kishore Harry, science correspondent at Tested.com and program manager on the Science and, Soci and Society team at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Without further ado, Gentlemen, take the podium. Thank you so much, uh, Gerald. Uh, I'm Kishore Hari, and I just want to say it's an honor to be back here at the Commonwealth Club. Some of my favorite conversations with scientists and, and societal figures has happened at this club. And I'm so excited to have a chance to speak with you tonight, Jim. Um, and uh, I'm going to get my phone out because I have a number of notes on here. But we're also going to be taking uh, questions uh, from our online audience. And we're going to try something new. They're going to text me the questions coming in from the online audience later. So I promise I'm not surfing the web uh, <laughs> and checking uh, yeah. sports scores. I am like following I'm not along. you. <laughs> yeah. I've uh, just realized also, I do apologize for my socks. I hadn't realized just quite how bright they are. So I hope that doesn't put people off. <laughs> that is classic TV presenter mode. <laughs> like you know that it's stripes, stripes don't show well on, on camera. Exactly. Um, I am so excited to have a discussion with you about your book, The Joy of Science, and your long storied car uh, career, both in physics and in science communication and public engagement. Um, I, I've i known your work for a long period of time because I've been a fan of so oh, many of your you. documentaries that have aired on the BBC and you can see many of them online. But I think many of our uh, US listeners may not be as familiar with your work. And I just wanna say, Jim is one of the great uh, interviewers of scientists out there. And so there's nothing quite as fraught as being the interviewer <laughs> that's interviewing the, the interviewer, but I'm gonna give it a whirl. Um, uh, so uh, starting with the, this idea of you, you mm. you're a physicist, you hosted a number of documentaries. I, I just wanna get a little bit into the background. Has this always been the career path? Like you were destined to be the BBC documentary <laughs> host no, from an early age? Not at all. When I started, when I got into science communication, probably in the mid 90s, it wasn't really a thing for academics. It wasn't a respectable thing to do. You know, I wanted to go and give talks to schools. I was the guy that, you know, if there was a, a media inquiry, a journalist wanted to know something about a science story, I'd, they'd point them to me because I didn't mind talking to journalists. 
but senior colleagues were warning me off you know Jim it was a time when you know I'd, it was a very traditional academic career you know I'd, I'd uh, got my PhD my degree then PhD and then a postdoc position I had a, a, a temporary lectureship I had a research fellowship I was you know working towards tenure and colleagues were saying don't waste your time you know going and giving these talks or talking to journalists or, or writing magazine articles focus on writing the papers in the journals and, and getting your research grants and giving talks at conference. And I said, why can't I do both? Uh, and I enjoyed doing both, but it was never an ambition to, you know, one day you'd be in front of a camera presenting a documentary. Just, you look back and you think, well, if I hadn't done that, that, wouldn't, that opportunity would never have arisen. I wouldn't have met so-and-so. And one thing led to another. Of course, nowadays, young, young scientists wanting to get into science communication see lots of opportunities and they may see, you know, already I want to do this, I want to be like him or her. Uh, it wasn't like that for me, but uh, it was a great journey. I have to say, like, looking at, talking to my son at home, he's 12 years old, and looking at all the YouTubers that he's yeah. subscribed to that are, that do science content now, the landscape's completely different. Absolutely. And I got started in science communication in that kind of 90s, early 2000s, and mm. there was very few people to look up towards. Right. I'm curious where you found um, a, the kind of motivation to keep going because it was a discouraging environment um, for a long period of time. Yeah, I mean, there weren't many role models around at the time. I remember, you know, as a young physicist reading, uh, you know, the, the classics, Carl Sagan and people like that. Um, but I really, I did it because I enjoyed it. I, I was saying, you know, I, didn't, I didn't get into science communication for some altruistic reason that I need to sort of spread the word among wider society about how wonderful science is, although, you know, I try to do that. I do it because I enjoy it. You know, I, I've always said I derive as much pleasure in explaining something complex, say, in, in quantum physics, and seeing someone's eyes light up and think, ah, oh, I think I get it now. I never, I'd never understood it before. That gives me as much a, 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 a sense of satisfaction as finding out for it, about it myself in the first place. So it's, it's, I enjoy doing it. I enjoy explaining. The true spirit of a teacher <laughs> with a camera in front of you. Yeah, with uh, a camera, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I've done all sorts of teaching. I've, I'm very proud of the fact that I've taught undergraduate physics uh, in an unbroken run of 31 years. Wow. <laughs> I've never taken a sabbatical because my life is half of my life is a sabbatical so I felt I always come back always come back and do the teaching now I kind of want to Google and see what your students are saying about you there are all those sites that like, <laughs> and some of them are middle-aged now which is quite <laughs> scary <laughs> uh, we haven't talked about your physics career like did you mm. was physics always the path for you were you a yeah pretty much I mean you know I, I got in, in uh, I fell in love with the subject in probably in my early teens I still wanted to be a rock guitarist. I still wanted to play for Leeds United soccer club in England. Uh, you know, the, the usual things that a teenage boy wants to do. Did you grow up in the UK and you wanted to be a, f you were a fan of I, Leeds? I grew up, I actually grew up in the Middle East. I grew up in Iraq. So uh, hence my, my, my surname. My father's originally from Iraq. He came over to England to study engineering, met my mum who's English uh, and married, went back to Iraq. And so although English is my first language, spoke English at home because that's my mother's tongue. Um, I went to school in Iraq until the age of 16. And so we, we used to go over back to England for some holidays to visit my maternal grandparents. And then we finally settled back in the UK permanently in 79 when Saddam came to power. <laughs> my father knew it is, it's one thing living under a dictatorship in, in countries like Iraq, but it was quite another to be living under Saddam. So we got out, we got out quick. And so, pardon this question, this it might be out of sort of left field. Was following leads a thing in Iraq? <laughs> oh, you, you <laughs> wouldn't believe it. Do you know, every kid in my school, and, and this wasn't even in Baghdad, you know, in the metropolis. This was, you know, my father worked for a, um, an engineering company about an hour's drive south of Baghdad in a small town. Every kid in my school there supported an English soccer team. There was one kid who supported, so there may even be teams that you know, people in the US won't have, won't have heard of, the team called Preston North End. They were down in like Division 4. And there was this kid who supported Preston North End. He'd never did, even been out of the country. So everyone had a team. So Leeds United, back in the 70s, they were, you know, the top. They were the best team. So 
I've supported them ever since. Their their fortunes have dipped somewhat in recent years, but you know that's what it's like. <laughs> of all the surprising things I expected to talk about today, <laughs> that was probably not <laughs> high among them. Um, no. <laughs> but back to physics. So mm. the it, the bug caught you right, yeah. as a teenager. As a, as a teenager, I fell in love with the subject. I realized that you know if I wanted to get answers, you know as many kids do to the big questions, you know how does the universe go on forever? What's inside a star? You know what is an atom made of? What is the nature of space and time? And of course back then there wasn't an internet there wasn't you know and also growing up in Iraq it, there weren't really many opportunities to, to, to find books in, in libraries to, to, to get answers to these questions so I knew that studying physics is what I needed to do if I wanted answers and, and it was just a sort of automatic you know we I came over to England uh, as nearly a 17 year old I did our A levels which is you know the the, the uh, qualifications you need to get into university did a physics degree and my love for the subject grew. I, did a, I then did a PhD in theoretical physics. Never looked back. Ne it never occurred to me to do anything else. <laughs> well, that is fantastic. And I think that PhD has paid dividends back to, uh, back to so many in the UK and beyond. Um, I want to uh, like start to focus towards this book because mm. I think fans of yours know that know you from documentaries on physics or energy or uh, your popular writing on physics. Right. That is not what this book is about. No, uh, no. A and uh, I, I, as somebody who's seen you interview so many people, I know how much like respect you have for expertise. Yeah. And this is a book a little bit outside of, of your wheelhouse. How did yeah. you, what was the motivation to kind of come to this topic of, of writing about scientific thinking and the joy of science? Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, it could uh, on one level be regarded as some sort of a, a self-help book. You know, this is how we scientists do things and wouldn't it be great if other people took our advice? Uh, yeah, but, but you sort of always, you know, feel a bit reticent as trying to sort of teach people to do things, which, as you say, you know, it's, it's in, you know, it's, uh, the philosophy of science and people who study the scientific method and science policy, or indeed psychologists, you know, these are experts in a lot of the areas that I talk about in the book. What I wanted to get across, first and foremost, was my passion for science. And, you know, it, it, following in the footsteps of people like Carl Sagan and Richard Feynman, you know, who say that uh, having a scientific view of the world, learning something about uh, the science behind everyday uh, uh, phenomena doesn't detract from the awe and wonder we can feel you know if, if we think about the uh, 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 eclipse uh, last weekend and the, the total eclipse we're going to get in across America next next spring everyone can enjoy that but I think having a scientific understanding of how it works doesn't detract from that joy it adds to it and that's what I wanted to get across that the joy the sheer joy the spiritual uplifting of having a, a deeper understanding of how the world works was there something about the moment that we live in that called you to write the book now? I think very, that had a, a big bearing on it, that we do certainly live in a, in a time when we're bombarded with data, bombarded with information uh, from all directions. We, we live in a, in a society amplified by the internet and social media, which is increasingly polarized. I mean, it's always been thus, you know, people have always been tribal and you know back before the internet you'd read a particular newspaper or you'd follow you'd have a particular ideological view and you surround yourself with people who thought the same way as you so that's not new but I think it's been amplified these days and we're losing the sense of uh, rationally thinking about mm -hmm. complex societal issues you know the the, the way humans behave is not, you can't write an equa a physics equation down to explain it. And physics is easy in comparison. Um, uh, and so I, I felt there was a need for get, just getting across the way we do science. If we do science properly, you know, examining biases, you know, the importance of uncertainty, the importance of being prepared to change your mind if you're wrong, uh, how do you find reliable data, who do you trust, all those sorts of things that we learn to do as scientists. Maybe we don't practice what we preach entirely. We'll and get, we'll get to that. Scientists are people, yeah. but if done properly, the scientific method itself, I feel, has lessons to give to wider society to help us in our daily lives. 
So what I hear you saying isn't talking about science capital S, not the business of the institutions that have become increasingly yeah. powerful, especially in a number of, of nations, um, but really the process. The, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the first message I got across in, in the book is that science, with a little s, is not a collection of facts about the world. That's called knowledge. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of ways we can gain knowledge about the world, not just through science. It happens to be a particularly reliable way, but, you know, through art and literature and, and, uh, and culture and, and history and talking to people who know more than you. Mm -hmm. um, but science itself is a process. It's a way of gaining knowledge. And I think that is an important lesson that people don't, don't always appreciate. It's the way we do, the way we gain knowledge. That's what we call science. Throughout the book, the pandemic comes up yep. quite a bit. Yep. Well. And you obviously authored this book during the <laughs> pandemic <laughs> <Indeed>. period. <laughs> and I'm wondering how that influenced your, uh, your thinking on, on this, the import, the lessons that you put in here, because mm. the book itself is shaped as eight lessons on, yep. uh, on scientific thinking. And so uh, I'm wondering how the, the pandemic influenced. Yeah, I mean, my, my editor at the publishers, Princeton University Press, kept stressing that this she wanted this to be a timeless one well, timeless but at least a book with a relatively long shelf life so not all the examples you can't say to timeless to a theoretical physicist no exactly. i don't think that exactly the, yeah, yeah the, the heat death of the universe will come <laughs> at some point right entropy will maximize <laughs> but it was inevitable that uh, you know a lot of the lessons a lot of the the the, the examples that i i, I call upon uh, uh, were of, of the time uh, of the pandemic and you know whether when I say you know why is it important for the public to have a, a more scientifically literate world view it's inevitable I'm going to say because we learn you know uh, uh, how, you know for example certainly in, in the UK probably here in the US you know when when the pandemic first hit the advice was wash your hands sing happy birthday twice through uh, and to, to make sure that and and if you do that you won't catch covid and then a few months later by the summer of 2020 we realized that the virus is is airborne and it's well wear masks social distance open windows and there were people who were saying you scientists don't know anything first you tell us to wash our hands now you tell us to wear masks i can't believe i can't believe anything you say so i felt that's exactly the sort of reason why we need to explain this is how science works. We learn as we gather more data and more information. And it's okay to change your minds. And it's okay to admit that you were wrong. Doesn't mean, it, you know, it, uh, yeah, unlike in politics, where a politician will never admit that they're wrong. That's seen as a weakness. In science, it's seen as a strength. Uh, I mentioned how the book is, is framed as, as eight lessons. Yep. And I, I'll say I was caught off guard because I read the title the joy of science and i was expecting to just come in and be hit with, with in joy. the face <laughs> with a whole sense of wonder but i i would say my the my experience of reading the first few chapters was one of uh not just an argument for scientific thinking it was almost a defense of scientific thinking yes i mean in in hindsight i look back and i wonder whether the title was even the correct one you know it's uh, yes i do you know i start and i end with with the awe the wonder the joy of actually having a scientific view of the world but you're right the bulk of the book is very much about it's it's, it's this is a good reliable way to to live our lives to you know to to, to learn about the world to be empowered by uh, you know to, to make better decisions um, uh, not always joyful. Sometimes they're hard, hard choices. When you have an argument with someone, you know, don't always be focusing on point scoring or winning the argument. Why not examine your own biases? Why do I think what I think? Maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, why, why not entertain that? Do you feel like we've lost that a little bit? Is this something that, that is this sort of we're following a trajectory that is concerning or or is this like a, a march towards progress? That it's, it's difficult to know because, you know, when, when you, you go on social media, on the uh, social media previously known as Twitter, uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's the two ends, the polarized extremes that are doing all the shouting. Mm -hmm. You know, the people in the middle, you know, are, don't want to get involved because suddenly every issue, however complex how a societal issue it is, uh, you know, we're living through horrible times now, you know, with what's going on in the Middle East. Everyone is taking sides. 
-hmm. you know you're, you're everyone's on the right side of history uh, you know you think about in, in hugely important societal debates you know transgender rights versus feminism and you are, you have to take a side and if you don't take a side you're my enemy um, so there's no nuance there's no room for debate there's no room for the the gray there's no room for acknowledging that these issues are complex so I think in a sense I think yes it is getting worse maybe maybe it's because you only hear the shouting from the extremes uh, and and in in the bell curve the vast majority of people in the middle just probably don't <laughs> have the appetite to get engaged so maybe it's not any worse than it used to be but it certainly seems that way sometimes I'm going to uh, come back to that because uh, we can't ignore the shouting for some reason. No. Uh, no. <laughs> um, but I want to pick up on this last point. Do you see scientific thinking as a way to address some of those larger issues? Like some of no. those issues you're talking they're not science in no, nature. No, no, no. And, and I think, it, you know, it, there's the danger of coming across as being arrogant. That, you know, we scientists know how to think. We're very smart. Uh, if, you only, if only you could think the way I do, you would see the world in a more enlightened way. So I think that's absolutely a danger and we have to be careful. My, th the point I make is that the way we do things in science uh, allows for progress. You know, the, 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 when I have a bit of research and I want to publish a paper, I will test it for de to destruction. I will make sure my, my computer code is giving the right numbers, or if you're doing an experiment, you, do it, you repeat it again and again and again. Because if you get something wrong, you'll be found out, and someone else will sh show your theory is wrong or your experiment is wrong. So we examine our, our world view all the time in science. We may want our theories to be right because we want to get promotion, we want to get tenure, we want to get you know, uh, the, the respect of our peers, but broadly the scientific approach is to always look for evidence to support your view, not to value opinion over evidence, to examine your biases. All these are the lessons that I get across in the book that we do in science. And then I just suggest that it could be that some of these get lessons would benefit us in the much, much more complex issues we deal with every day in society. What you're talking about is sort of an updated form of scientific literacy yeah. in, in a lot of ways. This is, I'm gonna get wonky here for a second. Uh, this is a scientific literacy is something that first appeared, I think, in the literature in the late late fifties, early sixties. Really gained mm. kind of popularization in the in the UK in the late nineties, yeah. and really uh, came across to the U.S. as a dominant conversation in the context of policy um, and how mm. universities and scientific leaders approach this problem. We're now going on 30 years of that conversation. Yeah. That makes me feel so old that I'm saying that it's <laughs> been 30 years since the first time we started talking about scientific literacy. Uh, and I'm gonna ask the, the big question, are we going about it the right way, um, given how long we've been mm. at this? I mean, you have like been involved in the field since, uh, yes. since it first came on the scene. Very often I feel that, you know, I mean, it's, uh, the audience listening and watching us now you know you wonder whether you're preaching to the converted mm -hmm. uh, you know people who want to hear what you have to say probably don't need to hear what you have to say because they understand it and while it gives you a nice warm feeling uh, giving a talk in, a, in a, a big science festival in England where you know you've got several hundred people in the audience or people come up to you and say I loved your book and that you know that inspired me to go and study science at university or I watched your documentary and it blew yeah I mean personally it makes me feel uh, proud of, of what I've done but has it helped wider society yeah I'm not sure I mean so the, um, a, a good friend of mine I guess you'll know him in America Brian Cox mm -hmm. uh, a fellow physicist um, the documentaries he makes for the BBC are on a different BBC channel so I, I, my documentaries tended to have to go out on BBC 4 which is a bit more niche, you know, I'll get mm -hmm. sort of half a million uh, people watching a my, one of my documentaries when, when it goes out. Um, slightly lower budgets because BBC4 isn't quite, you know, the big, you know, it's BBC1 or 2. BBC1 will be David Attenborough, right? The huge natural history things. But Brian Cox will make programs on BBC2. And a lot of my colleagues in academia criticize Brian. Oh, Brian Cox, he's just this pretty boy rock star image, you know, he's not a serious physicist, not like you, Jim, you know. You think, well, yeah, but he's reaching a demographic that I can't reach. 
you know, he, you know, he, he was in a pop group. He was in a, a, a band, in a rock band, and and uh, he has that sort of star quality. Um, but he's reaching two or three million people with his programs, and he's traveling the world in the last few years, doing these big arena tours, including in the states and um, and, uh, and in Canada. Uh, and he's reaching people who wouldn't normally get, get get switched on. I think that is important. People will go and see him because he's Brian Cox. He has that star appeal not because they want to know about black holes or, or space time and relativity so i yeah i'm not sure if you know is science communication simply feeding uh those who are interested in it in the first place who will be mm -hmm. interested anyway uh, and are we reaching out to those it's the people who are, are turning away from science turning away from you know rational thinking and evidence-based thinking they're the ones we need to to, to reach out to well, let's talk about that either disaffected group or the loud group as, as you mm. know, put it. I, I'm going to read something that a friend of mine told me. He he encapsulated the current moment as a battle between those silent voices who freely say, I don't know, and boisterous amplified voices of those who claim their opinion is the ground truth. Yeah. And there was something about that that just rang as, wow, that was 10 years of my experience on Twitter encapsulated in like one yeah. brief sentence. Yeah. It There is a huge majority, a huge population. Well, let me, let me take that back. Let me walk that back. There is a loud population of, uh, of people that have like a certain kind of confidence about yep, their yep. opinion being correct. And I'm used to that coming from being a sports fan. Um, like right. it rings as almost like a, a sports voice. And when I saw that like encroaching into the world of science, I was sort of taken aback at first because it was a race to be right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. As yeah. opposed to a race to not. And I just remember early in the pandemic running into a few voices that I knew that were just like, I don't know. We've known about this virus for three months. What do you want me to say? Yeah, yeah, uh, and they were sidelined. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. And uh, I want, I would love to hear you talk about this, um, yeah. this phenomenon that we live in, because there's so many in the middle that are pulled. Yes, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's an it's a, an effect well known among psychologists, the Dunning Kruger effect, right? It's uh, th those who know least about a subject are the ones likely to be most confident that they are right and to shout the loudest. It's a well known phenomenon. I don't think it's new, but certainly it's new when it comes to uh, debating important issues like uh, scientific issues on on social media. Uh, yeah. Uh, there is that, you know. I, I tend not to be conver uh, controversial on, on on Twitter. You know, I will, and unless it's something, unless it's a, I mean, if it's a, I don't know, a flat earther or someone who's going on about homeopathy or Reiki healing, then that just my blood boils and I feel, you know, <laughs> I have to say something. Um, but by and large, yeah, I don't get involved in the shouting because I think. Firstly, I don't think it makes any, any difference. If, if, if you shout, someone else is going to shout back at you, and I don't think that helps. I think it's, it's, it's good now and again to have a, a thread <laughs> of several tweets where you try and explain and hope that people will read through to the end, try and explain something in more than just whatever number of characters you're allowed to, uh, to use in one tweet. Um, it does take courage for that, th th that silent majority in the middle to speak up. Because, as I say, there is no room for middle ground. You know, you're either with me or you're against me. And, and, and if you are somewhere in the middle and you say, well, actually, no, you have a point, but so-and-so, the other side also has a point. Mm -hmm. You can't say that. You know, both sides then attack you. Both sides say, no, there's, you, know, you have to climb off the fence. You have to be either with me or you're against me. And so it does put people off. And I'm not quite sure to be honest, what what the answer is. Do you think there's room for an I don't know uncertain like element of culture to come back? Because all of my scientific training is basically like embrace yeah, the uncertainty. Right. The uncertainty is is actually kind of exciting. It's yes, really yeah, yeah. And uh, and it, it's sort of been flipped in in these conversations in society. Yeah. So I think that's where getting across how science works is important to try and explain that when you say I'm uncertain doesn't mean you don't know anything it means you know how much you know and you know what you don't know it's it's quantifying your level of confidence in something being true uh, uh, and uh, yeah I mean there's there are certain 
things about the world that are as, as so near to 100% certain, we, we can call them facts. If I jump off the roof of a building, I'm going to go down, not up, as close to, it could be, you know, we may be missing something in, the, in general relativity that suggests that, you know, on a particular day, <laughs> gravity becomes repulsive. But you're, you're almost, it's just that we're trained in science never to say 100%. But getting across the idea of uncertainty, that it's okay to be uncertain, that it's okay to admit your, your mistakes. I, if we have time, I've got a quick story. I, I, I made a, a BBC documentary about gravity, in fact, a few years ago. And... Um, We'd finished filming, uh, and when I was about to go to the studio to do the voiceover, and it was going to air a, f a few weeks later, and my producer called me up and he said, Jim, I've been on a physics forum. I think, well, that's, that's a mistake. To <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, But he said, but I think we've got, we've, he, he very politely said, we have got something wrong. I was explaining how in Einstein's general theory of relativity, clocks slow down uh, for, for, uh, due to... Uh, gravity if in a stronger gravitational field clocks run time runs slower and so I was comparing putting a clock at sea level at the North Pole compared with a clock somewhere else you know because the because the earth is oblate it's squashed the North Pole is closer to the center of the earth so it feels a slightly stronger gravitational pull so times will run time will run slower but a clock on the equator, the Earth is spinning on its axis, so that's moving. And so special relativity, Einstein's other theory of relativity, says that uh, high-speed motion relative to someone stationary, you'll see the clock running slower. So I go into this convoluted argument about which clock is running slower, the one at the North Pole or the one at the equator, and you have to do special relativity versus general relativity, see which wins. And my producer contacted me and said, I think, I think we've got this wrong. I contacted various friends that, and, and people who, who are experts, including um, Kip Thorne, um, mm -hmm. a, a Nobel Prize winner in physics. It, it, not many people know more uh, as much about general relativity as Kip Thorne. And um, yeah, and, and he got back to me. Yeah, he said, uh, Jim, I'm afraid you've bleeped up here. <laughs> uh, you've got it wrong. And so, and that email must have been thrilling. It was, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it was, well, we knew, so, so, but of course the answer is that the Earth is, is, is the surface of what's called a geoid. It's, it's, a, it's a surface of equipotential. So every point at sea level on the surface of the Earth, from the North South Pole to the equator, all feel the same gravitational potential. So all clocks tick at the same rate. I didn't have to go through this convoluted wins. So we went back to the BBC, we said, look, we've got to put a stop on the, uh, on the transmission because we've made a mistake. Said, well, just look, just reshoot the bits where you got wrong. Uh, no one will be any the wiser. And I said, no, what would be a really good idea here is for me on camera to say, and at this point, my producer pointed out to me that I'd made a mistake, that, you know, and, and, and in fact, I was wrong. So the explanation I've just given you is wrong, and this is why. And they said, oh, you don't want to do that, Jim. You're, you know, you're, we're worried about your reputation as a physics professor. You know? mm. I said, yeah, but that's how we do science. We admit our mistakes. It's not, I, I'm not being courageous, you know, and so we persuaded them. And that's what happens in the documentary. I say, at this point, things went a bit pear-shaped because I got it wrong. Actually, I think it's scarier if you don't issue the correction as yeah. a physicist. As a, yeah, Because exactly. you're going to get that email from Kip Thorne. Right, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's right, you, you got and it wrong. And it's going to have more than one bleep in it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's amazing that the BBC was so willing to let you go to they weren't so willing to begin with but uh, <laughs> but yeah we persuaded you, you them persuaded we persuaded them that it would make better telly <laughs> and what was the response for um the response was i certainly got emails from from viewers saying we we uh, uh, are very impressed by your courage you know to admit your mistake uh, again, not understanding that actually in science is perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. If we didn't admit mistakes, we wouldn't make progress. We wouldn't learn anything new. <laughs> We'd be still thinking what we thought at the beginning of, you know, of time. And so I said, no, it doesn't, doesn't need courage on my part. I didn't feel sheepish about it or, you know, it, that's just the way, you know, it's fine to make mistakes because now I know more than I did back then. What has always struck me about these moments, because I, I've talked to a number of scientists over the years that have made mistakes in public mm -hmm ways, whether it be in a, in a paper or a, a lecture or something right. even more prominent than that, and going through the process of correction, what I always struck me about those moments is the, is the sense of integrity that came across yeah. of the people involved. And that had more of an impact on me than I think the correction ever did, the details right. of the correction. Yes. I yeah. don't think I can tell you some of the corrections that I've come across, but I can tell you that it changed my relationship to that person, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that individual. 
not to all of science but just to that yeah. individual well, it, it shows there's an honesty about it yeah. that you're not just there to, to to win arguments to score points to to get the, the next research grant. I mean okay some scientists some scientists <laughs> do some, <laughs> let's, let's not let's not pretend we're all saints but I mean yeah in, 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 that's how science should work so speaking uh, riffing off of that last point not all scientists are people too mm. um, they are subject to the same biases that all of yep. us are uh, there's some bad actors. Um, it's not a field, especially now that it's it's grown. There's millions of scientists across the world. It's subject to the same kind of issues that we see across all of society. Yeah. Uh, and it's something that we have to grapple with in the context that we're talking about, because we can't all just say just trust the scientists. Yeah. 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 It doesn't go anywhere anymore. So how do you grapple with with the fact that we are? human and some yeah. the same biases well, and mistakes. I think the first thing to say is it's it's different in different disciplines of science. So there's a much bigger problem in the social sciences or in the medical sciences than say in, you know, physics or astronomy. Um, the, just the nature of the subjects it, it means more for society. Uh, it also differs depending on whether you're an academic working at a university where uh, What's most important is the respect of your peers and, and getting your paper published in a journal that people will read and believe and that will cite afterwards. But if you work for a big corporation you know, or, or you know, a pharmaceutical company, for example, where profits are important, then, then it, it is more difficult mm -hmm. to, to, to ensure that there's integrity and honesty and that you're working really for the, you know, to, to, as a seeker of truth. Mm -hmm. so it, yeah, we shouldn't shy away from the fact that there is a problem and as you say science is so huge so important so integral to all our lives now um by and large i think it's still sort of sort of goes along bumbles along more or less roughly in the right direction when a paper is published uh or, or a result is announced of some some new discovery you know, we've had recent examples, you know, uh, uh, room temperature superconductivity and things like that, which had made, made the headlines. If, if it can't be reproduced and if other scientists can't replicate those results uh, and test them and verify them, it doesn't matter how hard the scientists who's plugging their particular idea or theory or experimental result works. That is science, the scientific method marches on they will be forgotten so on the whole it's self-correcting if it works properly but i yeah. think ideally it's self correcting Ide yeah but this is a whole like multi-hour conversation we're about to have if we yeah, delve yeah, into yeah, that yeah, topic yeah. i think there's a lot that we have to improve but there are measures that have been put in place to lead to that self -correction. absolutely and i'm a glass half full person so i, I tend to try and I, on, look on the positive. <laughs> I mean, you did write a book called The Joy of Science. That, well, so there you go. Uh, let's hope so. Um, I want to ask, like, we are moving into an era where the science being done isn't necessarily always going to be done by a scientist. Mm. It's sometimes going to be done by an AI. It's something yep. that is non-human yep. in yep. a lot of ways. And so when we move to this era of not a human bias or a human error, and one that's driven by something else that's trained on yeah. uh, data. How do you think this conversation starts to evolve? Well, I, we've always relied on technology. Technology has always replaced humans all the way from the invention of the plow all the way through to steam power. And, and, uh, and you know, the, when the pocket, first pocket calculator came out, people were be bemoaning the fact that our kids will never learn how to do long division because they can just push buttons. You know, who, who cares now? You know, I, I write a paper in theoretical physics and, and there'll be some numerical calculation that has been produced by a computer code that I wrote. Yes, I wrote the lines of code, but it, it chugged through and got the, the numbers and did the numerical integrations or whatever to give me the number, which I couldn't have done. So we've always used technology. Um, AI coming in, yes, it's a, it's a game changer, but I think humans are remarkable at adapting to new technology. And the, the fact that we just take for granted now that we carry these iPhones around with us that are supercomputers in our pockets and, and no one really knows what goes on inside it. But, you know, 
20 years ago, that would have seemed to seem like something out of I, Star Trek. <laughs> I am, I'm uh, shocked. I'm, I'm surprised at the level of optimism given the nature of the conversation at this moment. Yeah. Where, which is one of a little bit of pessimism a around this. Yeah. And, I, and I'll just share a, a quick story. I took my first ride in one of those autonomous. I uh, saw them uh, out, outside on the streets here I in San Francisco. <laughs> I took my Ooh. first ride and I have to say I had a wonderful experience. I went through the Uncanny Valley in maybe five minutes because it was driving spectacularly and the experience inside was was really comfortable and nice but as we went through the streets inevitably every few blocks there was somebody trying to mess with the car in some way um <laughs> and it spoke to the kind of like discomfort that exists in the now yeah yeah but i think that will change i mean i think we will adapt to it the the fact is once driverless vehicles are acknowledged to be, I mean, it's, we're only at the beginning of that journey. Yeah. Once they're acknowledged to be s safe and reliable, they will cut down on road deaths absolutely dramatically. Uh, these, these, the AI in the car doesn't get tired, it doesn't get distracted, it doesn't get bored. Um, uh, if it makes a mistake, it learns from the mistake and it instantly tells every other vehicle that it's connected to and, and teaches them to learn from the mistake. The problem is, it, you know, we, we, we have the issue that you know, if, a, if a driverless car kills someone on a, on a crossing, there'll be an outcry. If a human does it, well, you know, humans are fallible, you know, humans make mistakes. It's sort of, we, we allow that. But if we reduce by tenfold the, the deaths on the road, even one from an AI is gonna be unacceptable. But we will, that will change. I think the more important thing is not things like you know from I mean, not that we, you've mentioned it but you know the terminator terminator scenario and and machines rising and taking over the world i think the more, more important issue is automation robotics and taking jobs um uh, 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 you know and what what do what do we we do if we if we're not needed anymore because an ai can do it better than me again technology has always replaced humans uh, and we've always found different uh, other things to do um, but what we do need is is the discussion about the ethical implications of AI and and, and the putting in the the legislations in, in place and you know to, to make sure that uh, it, it can't just do what whatever it wants I know a lot of technology companies a lot of um, policymakers are engaged in that conversation. Do you think science is engaged in that conversation yet? I know mm. where science is taking AI is in a very different track. They're using it as a tool to optimize research, to yeah. to kind of find patterns that would be really difficult to in the in the, with with humans right now. So yeah. it's a different kind of calculus, but at the same time, the ethics conversation is not Avoidant of something. yeah, I don't think enough has happened. You know, so in 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 uh, medical sciences, we've always had to, to uh, involve the ethics and the Hippocratic oath and so on. But in other areas, in computer science and engineering and physics and maths, for example, no, I don't think we've we've thought enough about the ethics of what what's going on. Yes, it's affecting us now. You know, when I when I set essays for my students and half the class are using ChatGPT. You know what do I do? <laughs> How do I, I can't prove the, and and so we have to learn to adapt. Mm -hmm. the, the point is we can't slow down the technology, we can't stop it, mm -hmm. but we have to be ready for it. That's the big difference. We've pretty much spent the last like fifteen twenty minutes circling around trust. Mm. Like this is the dominant issue I think in your book. It is the dominant issue of today and. It's not, trust isn't a simple thing. Like you talk to social scientists about yeah. trust, they will talk about warmth and competence and all of these factors. Like, and trust doesn't exist on the individual level, it exists on the societal level, the institutional level. Um, with that qualification, we live in an age that feels more fragile when yeah. it comes to yeah. trust. Um, and certainly we've seen declining trust in institutions emerge not just here in the states but across the world i was wondering how you in see that decline in trust as impacting mm. the scientific enterprise and and how do you approach this kind of trust conundrum that we live in right now yeah even though i've written a book that that sort of touches on this subject the, the issue of trust is one that i i i feel less far less well qualified to 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 offer solutions for compared with 
pe- uh, sociologists and psychiatrists and psychologists you know, who, who, who understand the human condition far better than me. Um, but certainly I think the issue of you know, the fact that we are bombarded with every opinion with from every side and and every opinion is available whereas in the past it it might it might have been that we didn't know where to go to find an opinion on something or to to find some information now we have too much and so how does the average person know how to sift through and filter and 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 what to believe Uh, you know we can explain as science communicators the need for going for you know the primary sources uh, uh, you know, check your evidence. Who is telling you this? Do they have a vested interest in what they're saying? Did they have an ideological stance? The difficulty is that the average person doesn't have time to go. You know, uh, tilting at windmills. I don't have time for stick it. your nose yeah. in every. You know, while you see something, the, the fact is, you know, psychologically, we we tend to want to believe what you know what we already agree with. Uh, you know, and we want we want to live in our echo chamber. Uh, uh, and so if you are faced with uh, a, a view or an idea that goes against what you already think, you know, that's, you know, psychologists call this the, uh, uh, um, what, what's the, I forget the, the, the term now. Um, anyway, they, they, they have a, a term for it, which is essentially a, a genuine physical feeling of discomfort when, when you, 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 you hold a view, you believe something, you, you thought this view was right, and then you're confronted with evidence to the contrary. So you try really hard to, to, to dismiss that evidence. It's fake news, it's not, a, I, I don't believe it. And then the flimsiest of evidence that supports what already, you already believe, you will hold up as, as proof that you were right all along. So it's part of the human condition. It's not, I, I don't think it's a societal problem certainly not one that has only just happened you know in modern times it's, it's part of the hu- human condition that we have to fight against and educating people to examine their bi- biases uh, and 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 check their sources and where do you get your evidence from i think is, is a necessary lesson people have to learn because you need to know who to trust and and why you should trust them so one more question before i mm. flip to physics because I can't okay. have you here and not ask a couple <laughs> questions about physics. Um, so much of science is still ingrained in the academia model, the, the old institution that you know has been around hundreds of years, the idea of a college yes. uh, where you bring together a small group of people, you put them on a campus together, um, you have them like focus on some like really intricate topics for a period of time. But the entire concept of that is one of a small number of people at this kind mm-hmm. of closed away facility that is uh, disconnected mm. from the community that surrounds them. Uh, and, I was, and I think about what we're talking about here. So much of it is about relationship and, mm. uh, and communication with people you know and creating a sense of trust. I, I'm, I'm really left with this large question of how does science need to change? in this moment, yeah. not just how do we empower the individual to be able to think more like a science, but how does yeah. the enterprise need to change to meet people where this moment exists mm. now? Well, certainly in science communication, it happened in the UK about 20 years ago, where we moved from a model which was called the public understanding of science. That was that then came, became regarded as the deficit model. And it changed from public understanding of science because that suggests the public were these empty vessels to be filled with our knowledge and wisdom, we scientists who know better than them. And it changed to the public engagement in science, which becomes a two-way conversation. And I think what's really encouraging is when you see big projects, you know, citizen science projects, where you involve the wider community. Not in all areas of science, it doesn't work in all, you know, you can't get everyone involved in doing sort of nuclear physics or quantum mechanics. But certainly, you know, where it comes to environmental uh, science, uh, uh, biodiversity issues, um, where you engage the public so that they are, they feel they're part of the process, that then it's not just, you know, the, the, uh, what's going on inside the ivory towers at the universities S- science the endeavor of finding out how the world is 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 not just something that the the few are allowed to you know the the high priests are allowed to indulge themselves in it's there for everyone 
uh, get m making it available for everyone I think is a first step and and you know scientists themselves have to take that step it also feels like some of the grand scientific challenges that we've talked about for years whether it be climate change yep. or those are not to be solved by scientists they are solved by opening the doors to yeah yeah um, many aspects of society to work together and having people this. more more scientifically literate mm -hmm. in a democracy you then you then elect the people who are going to enact those ideas and policies that that mm -hmm. uh, with your scientific understanding tells you are the right ones uh so hard segue where there's no segue to physics from that conversation just do it but i'm just <laughs> going for it uh i think this is one of the most exciting periods of physics i can recall during my lifetime we've had so many grand results from large experiments. The LIGO experiment, mm. which detected um, uh, gravitational waves. The uh, CERN continues to produce results mm. that call into question the nature of the standard model of physics. Mm. I, I wanted to start at a high level. Is my like excitement of where we are in physics, like is that how you feel as well as somebody on the theoretical side of things? It's a slightly different picture from the theoretical mm. side of things. So, so um, I can certainly uh, believe an argument that says that you know the discovery of gravitational waves in 2016, the the, the confirmation of the Higgs boson in 2012 at the Large Hadron Collider, although exciting and they made headline news, these were discoveries that we were expecting to make. Right? No, they were almost bocking up. Higgs boson found it. Gravitation waves, thank goodness. We knew they were out there. We just didn't detect them. Tick the box. They weren't new. They weren't revolutions in physics. The, 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 the big revolution in, 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 in physics in, in my lifetime was probably the discovery of dark energy, the fact that the universe's expansion is, is accelerating. No one expected that. No one even, what? Where did that come from? And there haven't been enough of those. You know, the, after the Large Hadron Collider discovered the Higgs, there was the hope that we would discover other particles. We have discovered particles, but they're not, you know, fundamental particles like the Higgs. We haven't discovered um, what the particles of dark matter are, for example. Mm -hmm. So there are frustrations, I think, that are building up in, in theoretical physics, maybe as well as in, in, in experimental physics, that we haven't cracked problems like what is dark matter made of, what is dark energy. Um, there, there, there have been advances in understanding things like the nature of black holes and certainly discovering uh, 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 supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies and things like that. Um, one of the, uh, you know, the, the big uh, hopes was you know, to discover a theory of everything. But by everything, I mean everything in the physical universe, not, not human human nature. Um, uh, and one of the leading candidates is, is string theory. And there's been the hope that string theory would be, you know, the, the correct theory of, of, of quantum gravity, as, as we call it. Um, while there are so many people working in string theory, and it's probably still the leading contender, there is a frustration building that it hasn't sort of reaped the, the, the rewards. We haven't uh, confirmed it yet. And so there's a sort of a, a, a jitteriness, I think, in, within the physics community that we haven't got there yet. But... As you say, it's still the, it, what, what's exciting about the exciting times is that there are still mysteries to be solved. If we had got all the answers, then that would be really boring. That would yeah. be really depressing. <laughs> not not would we be out of a job, but you know. I'm taking some joy in in the frustration, I, hearing I, about the jitteriness, I, because indeed. that's I think that's a place where that's, that's, innovation know, comes from. I always say, you know, when you when you're doing a big jigsaw puzzle, the joy is in actually finding the pieces to put it. Once it's done, it's finished. Well, okay. That's nice. Now I want to start another one. <laughs> one of the last conversations I moderated with the Commonwealth Club before the pandemic was with Brian Green, who's a mm. famous yep. um, string theorist. And um, I'm going to ask you a question mm. that I asked him. Is like, we're at this stage now where a lot of the experimental physics that are going on are incredibly grand scales. They are expensive experiments. James Webb launching a, yeah. a multi-billion dollar a telescope to, you know, out to the Lagrange point. That is not a cheap endeavor. No. Uh, building in, like the next generation particle accelerator, these are not cheap endeavors. Uh, and I, I simply asked him, are we reaching like sort of a, a, a limit uh, of a kind with experimental physics? Mm. And does that mean there's a moment for theoretical physics is going to become more of a centerpiece uh, in the years ahead? 
I think we, we are going to have to be more imaginative in finding ways of testing our current theories of physics. You're right, there's a limit to how big you can build a particle accelerator. Uh, and already, you know, we, the, the, throughout the 20th century, we realized that the big experiments could not be carried out by one country. It, it, it had to be international collaborations in just what we call big science. You can't build an accelerator the size of the solar system, you know, if that's what you need to do to, to discover the particles that, you know, the, even the more fundamental particles that would uh, test the, our theories of everything. But there may be ways of doing experiments on a smaller scale that are just more imaginative, you know, in other areas, you know, condensed matter physics, for example, that we simply haven't thought of yet, or, or, or being more intricate, being more precise in our measurements rather than going big. Um, going small but going being more careful uh, I have hopes that we will you know I, I, what I don't want is for theoretical physics to just to become metaphysics and philosophy you know because we're just pontificating about whether there are parallel universes which we could never possibly check you know that's that that does you that's not science. grounded in what it's not science you know it's, it's not science it's science is empirical if you can't test it it's you know you can just make up any any old stuff you want <laughs> if, it, if the maths works and it's pretty math then you know is that enough you might as well become one of the lab voices at that point yeah yeah um <laughs> i'm going to uh turn this over to some audio questions or listener questions that that have uh, had texted in so we'll start first with how do you recommend dealing with people who don't believe in science or have trouble trusting scientists um starting off with a very difficult question. yes yes i mean if there was a simple answer we'd all be doing it i think um I, I think acknowledging that we we may not be right, acknowledging this the, this the, the fact that scientists are always uncertain, not we, what you don't want to come across is saying, look, I know more than you, I know better than you because I've studied all this time. I mean, it, it's a it's just it's a fact. It's true in the same way that you know your plumber knows better than you do how to fix your boiler, your dentist knows how to fill it filling than than you do. But I don't think that helps when you're trying to get people to trust science, science and scientists. So I think getting across the idea that uh, we are prepared to listen, we're prepared to change our minds, and this is why I think this is right. Here's my evidence to support it, but I may be wrong. And I think getting across the idea that I'm, I'm examining my own biases can, you hope, get the other side to think well okay well maybe i shouldn't be so dogmatic about my view maybe i should be questioning why i believe what i do that may be i mean people talk about that as, as being a way of of uh, debating with conspiracy theorists for example but it's tough it's a tough one i i love that the the answer is really grounded that that the goal isn't necessarily to develop trust for the scientists it's to establish a relationship yeah absolutely. and that can go in a lot of spectacular directions you need that first absolutely yeah. yeah uh next question is do humans have a natural inclination towards scientific outlooks and scientific method or do humans naturally incline toward irrationality and suspicion of fact-based exploration and explanations i think an inclination towards uh, irrational thinking or superstitions is a substitute when we don't have the rational explanation. You know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, you know, people didn't understand what lightning was or what thunder was or, or how an earthquake happened. And so you build narratives, you build stories to try and comfort you or give you an explanation. But we do seek a rational explanation. We do want to know. I mean, I think the human condition is that we are curious about our world. And when we find an explanation that fits what we see, then then we will discard the one that, that, that was based on uh, um, a, a belief that didn't have any evidence to support it. So I think moving towards a rational explanation of the world is something that defines humanity. I, I don't think it's the irrational side. One of the hard things with this question is like, I think the one thing humans are very bad at is seeing the progress over time. Our relation to time is not great. And yeah. we forget about what rationality and this question looked like yeah. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, yeah. 100 years ago. 
Um, and I think the, the time-based question, when you ask questions about sort of future outlook, becomes a really interesting variable to think about. Yes, and, and very difficult to, to very different. project forward. Yeah, yeah. I don't think we'd be up here if we if we were able to <laughs> <laughs> no, predict that's time. True. <laughs> um, next question. Do you think lots of people are turned off of science and a science based outlook as a result of bad or incompetent science education? Uh, sadly yes, I do. I agree. I think uh, I encounter all the time two groups of people. One group will say, you know, I, uh, I had an inspiring science teacher at school and that got, now I fell in love with chemistry because of my science teacher. Or I watched a documentary or read a certain book, uh, you know, and, and that set me on a path. But equally you get someone saying, if only s my teacher at school had explained to me this science the way you've explained it. Uh, you know, because they had a bad teacher, a teacher, not even necessarily a bad teacher, but a teacher who wasn't themselves confident enough in, in, in explaining the science. I, you know, I, with uh, I, the science education at school is the single most important point in our lives that's going to help us develop a rational view of the world you know we're all curious as kids and and uh, you want we want to ask the why questions and we always say the scientists are the children who've never grown up we've never stopped asking why but something happens you know when when you get to certain and clearly we don't all want to be scientists the world will be a boring place but you know, without a good teacher, uh, and I think, and the same applies in all in all subjects. And and you can't live in an ideal world where everyone has brilliant teacher every in every subject. But, but the way we see science certainly, I think, can change. I do think we are uh, approaching a point now where the facts about science, you know, the bones in the body, the periodic table of elements, you could just look them up, right? Facts is not that's not science. I think there should be much more of a focus on the process of science, the way we do science. Uh, and we can look up the facts or ask ChatGPT or whatever, or Google it. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna channel the spirit of the Exploratorium, uh, a world-renowned museum that's, that's mere, you know, hundreds of feet from where we sit, and uh, which was founded by Oppenheimer, not that one, the, his yeah. brother. Um, that science education, while we focus on the moment um, during our our adolescence and youth, it's a lifelong endeavor. Yeah, yeah. And the more that we're able to make it a lifelong endeavor, the more benefits that we can Never too late. <laughs> um, and that's a great transition to our last audience question. Oppenheimer was a huge movie this year. Mm. Did you see it? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, is there a scientist or physicist that you would like to see their story make it to the big screen or to a larger general audience? There's probably a long list. I, when I was a, a student studying physics as an undergraduate, I, I sort of worked my way through a lot of the biographies of the famous physicists of the early 20th century, particularly the founding fathers of quantum mechanics. You know, Niels Bohr and Heisenberg and Schrodinger and Pauli and Dirac. Any one of those, I think, would make a great movie. Probably the one who, although there are certain shady aspects to his life that I think we need to, to examine and think about, I think the one who would be most entertaining would certainly be Richard Feynman. Mm -hmm. uh, th there are just so many s wonderful stories about him. And I know um, he, his, his character made a very, had a very small role to play in the Oppenheimer film, and I was mm -hmm. hoping to see more. I was hoping when they had the, the Los Alamos, I thought they'd have Richard Feynman that the story of him climbing through the hole in the fence and going back <laughs> through the, the the front gate and the guards wondering why he's going coming in and never going out again um but yeah i i think that i think that's a great vehicle it'd be a complicated story but it would it, be an entertaining one. it would be an entertaining one yes absolutely um we've reached that time where we have uh one last question and i want to start by saying like my relationship with science is uh has been a complicated one my father was able to come to this country because he got admitted to a science program and allowed my family to come here. He grew up in a small village in India. So our relationship with science has transcended generations. Mm -hmm. It's created opportunities not only for us, but other people that we're able to bring over as well. And, um, y you know, in that way, science has meant something more to me than, than just the process of thinking yeah, science. Yeah. But at the same time, like m when I started pursuing a scientific career, at the heart of it is this sense that, I, uh, that I'm exploring these questions and there's always this bit of wonder at the bottom. And we've spent 
the last hour discussing some grand societal challenges ahead for us. But I don't want to forget that your book is titled The Joy of Science. Mm -hmm. And I just want to ask, is science still joyful to you on a day-to-day basis? Yes, it is. I, I, you know, I don't go around you know, uh, looking at the world through sort of physicists' eyes and, and sort of do calculations and seeing everything in terms of equations. But having a, a, a sense that I can, I can understand a lot of how the world is, is a tremendous privilege. And, and, a, and it does give me a joy. There, there's that sense of awe and wonder. I, in the book, I, in fact, I, I, I talk about the rainbow in the book mm-hmm. and, and, and how... Uh, you know, we can all enjoy the beauty of the rainbow, uh, but having a scientific understanding of the fact that no two people looking up at the rainbow are actually looking at the same rainbow because, you know, different droplets of, of rainwater are reflecting the red light or the blue light into your eyes. They're not reflecting the red light into the person next to you. That's a different droplet is doing that for the person next to you. So we all see our individual rainbows or the fact that the rainbow, in fact, is not an arc. That's just because it's cut off by the ground. If you could climb up a mountain or look through the uh, through um, on on a on a plane, you might see a rainbow as the full circle that it should be. So things like that, you know, I I can still enjoy a rainbow, but if with a scientific understanding, there's even more awe, even more enjoyment. I think that that phrase, "We all see our own rainbow," is a perfect encapsulation of the joy of science. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jim. Al Kalili, uh, Distinguished Professor of Theoretical Physics at the University of Surrey. This has been an enlightening and wonderful conversation that made me think the glass is half full. Uh, we encourage everyone to pick up a copy of, of Jim's book, The Joy of Science, available at your local bookstore. I, I'm Kishore Hari. Thank you for joining us for this program tonight. Thank you very much for having me.